So our second speaker of this afternoon is Yang Zheng, who is an assistant um, professor of cultural anthropology in the Department of Applied Social Sciences at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Her work deals with the urban development and migration in China, and she focuses on development, temporality, and mobility, examining issues related to the state formation, labor, infrastructures, and informal economy in the context of urban China, and Beijing, uh, for instance, among other towns, which is enlarging now the spectrum. She's also interested in issues related to development and energy, such as China wind power project, project and their global impact. Zan is the winner of 2020 um, Vermeer Prize for the best article, and now she's currently working on a book manuscript tentatively titled Brutal Temporary, Venture Immigrants on the Politics of Futures on China's Urban Fringe. She's now talking, as you can see there, uh, about internal borders and racialized strangers, the case of Chinese rural migrant workers. Thank you very much. Okay. Um. Thank you, uh, Sylvia, for the introduction. And, uh, and thank you, Didier, for having me here. And thank you all, the audience, for uh, being here and joining us today. Um, uh, I feel very honored and privileged to be here to share uh, some of my observations during my field work uh, uh, in Chinese metropolitan cities, such as, um, thank you. Beijing and Shenzhen uh, for the past 10 to, 10 to 12 years. And uh, I would like to start uh, today's talk with this picture. In this picture, uh, you can see there is a window, a mattress, and a half demolished wall. I took this picture in 2019 when the migrant community in China, where I spent years doing field work, was under demolition. The space shown in the picture was once home to my friend, Qi Jun. Uh, Qi Jun was a migrant worker um, coming from rural China. Uh, more specifically, Qi Jun was a scrap picker. I got to know him in 2013. Many times I, I, I saw, I, I sat with him actually in front of this wall and asking him about all the stories that he had experienced and I had so many questions. Um, usually he cut me off and almost every time he would respond with a standard reply. We are from different worlds so you wouldn't understand. And sometimes it feels very strange because even if I repeat what he just told me, he would still say, you don't understand. Uh, it's not the case. So on that day, when I took that picture, I still tried to show that um, I understand what he had gone through. So I, I, I said, I cannot imagine what you're going through, uh, losing a place to live, had to move again. And he smiled at me and said, this is actually very much anticipated. I'm so used to it. It's no big deal. So, so that's the moment that I had with Qi Jun. The existential differences mentioned by Qi Jun can refer to many different things. But the main difference in his mind was this piece of document. This is called household registration. Uh, as you can see in the picture, household registration is a sort of a document uh, for Chinese citizens. And in this document, uh, in this uh, household registration, there are a lot of information of a person, a place of origin, place of birth, uh, date of birth, and most importantly, as you can see, the red stem on the top, um, that's, that says rural household registration. So there are two, two kinds of households in China, rural household registration 
and urban household registration. Um, so China has this very unique household registration system, which differentiate the population into the urban ones and the rural ones. And this system was implemented in 1958, nine years after the establishment of People's Republic of China. Um, it was a means of controlling population's movement. Um, it is commonly understood that household registration system corresponds to its socialist planned economy, where industries and people were largely fixed spatially. And when China inserted itself into the global economy in the 1980s, these internal borders set up by household registration system was often considered as obstacles or barriers. But ironically, this institutionalized urban-rural divide in China did not prevent people from moving from rural parts to the urban cities. Um, so you can see this is a map which shows the pattern of internal migration in China. So this map, map is actually a little bit dated, uh, but the pattern remains the same. The green color indicates outflow of migrants, and the red color indicates the inflow of migrants. So since the 1980s, the number of rural migrants in China has kept growing. According to a statistical report, the number of rural Chinese migrants um, working away from home is now almost 290 million. So that's a huge number. So Qi Jun, one, being one of those uh, two, 290 million rural migrant people, <clears throat> once said to me, when you venture out, there is always a price to pay. His comments point out the fact that contrary to common perception, internal borders are not kept uh, to prevent border crossing, but to ensure that when people cross borders, they become identifiable, questionable, and therefore kept at the margin. So according to my uh, fieldwork experience, I think there are two significant effects of these internal borders. First, uh, there is a spatial separation of income and rights for Chinese rural mi migrants. When rural residents migrate to cities in search of cash income and so-called um, the better future, they are included in the production system with their labor, but they are excluded from the urban social welfare system. This means that entitlements such as health benefits, education, basic income, and housing remains, those benefits remain in the villages of their birthplace and cannot be easily transferred to the cities. So many rural migrants live in a very crowded factory dormitories um, and they have to separate from their families, their children, and uh, once a year, probably during spring festival, they would travel back to their village to visit uh, their relatives. And there are many other migrant workers uh, who move their entire family to cities and live in cramped conditions on the urban fringes. So, so here is there's a typical uh, migrant community in China. You can see the high-rise buildings are the urban space, and the, uh, in the middle, all these very kind of informal housing, uh, which were built by villagers themselves, um, they were there to host rural migrants in China. So in China, there is this term, it's called floating population. This term has been coined to reflect that rural migrants face a dilemma. Uh, they are not able to settle in the cities uh, where they were treated as temporary visitors. But at the same time, they cannot go back because they, there are very limited 
job opportunities back in their hometowns. So this spatial separation of production and social reproduction, or income and rights, uh, is key to make, to make the so-called cheap labor in China for the past three decades. And second, the uh, institutional barriers, such as rural household registration, uh, is used to select the deserving talents to be incorporated uh, as the urban members. So um, apart from keeping rural mi migrants uh, included in the urban world with their uh, labor, these internal borders are there so the government can select those who are considered favorable in the process of so-called um, industrial upgrading in China. So for example, right now, there are many Chinese cities started to recruit more talents. Um, and rural migrants with, with higher education degrees, sometimes they were able to um, be granted uh, urban household uh, registration through a credit system. Um, However, it is more common, for example, in the city of Shenzhen, where uh, this is a, a center of the world factory in China, it is very rare to see rural migrants get incorporated into the talent system. More often than not, they are uh, still considered as uh, undeserving migrants who usually to, to be displaced whenever there are new projects uh, that are <coughs> taking over uh, their communities. So even though uh, China's household registration remains in place uh, until today, on the ground, uh, the control and the policing over Chinese internal borders uh, uh, have undergone several phases, which I'm going uh, to be elaborating. Uh, so when rural to, mig to urban migration began to proliferate in China in the late 1990s, the internal border uh, of rural and urban world were very much embodied. This means um, those migrants who left their place of origin were treated as transgressors uh, in the cities, and it's very common for them to be criminalized. And at that time, there was this um, system called the custody and the repatriation system, uh, which was in place to actualize population control on the ground. It was very common for the police to physically detain rural personnel and repatriate them back to their registered uh, addresses. In a statistical report back in the 1995, uh, a custody and repatriation station in China has taken 100,382 uh, 100, migrants into custody over the course of three years, from 1992 to, to 1995, among whom 91,849 were said to have broken the law, uh, but along you know, you, when you look into the document, it is usually the case that, for example, 260 were taken into custody for street vending, and uh, 37 were unregistered, unregistered drivers, and in 12,110 cases, migrants were taken into custody simply because they had, quote, illegally out-migrated, unquote. So the, back in the days, it was very common to see this crim, uh, criminalization of rural migrants, and many of them entered the custody and repatriation system. They were uh, usually kept in the station for several days and then picked up by their relatives um, and going back home. So, but during this period of time, even though there were uh, discrimination, there were criminalization, migrant business were, were actually valued 
in China because that was the early days of China's market re reform. And precisely because more migrants were not affiliated with urban formal institutions, they become the pioneer in the market in Denver uh, during the open and reform period in China. So um, I'm going to show you this picture here. So you can see this is the, what we call the, this is also a migrant community in Beijing. And rural migrants there, they were uh, specialized and very successful in doing garment uh, business. And a community, community member once told a journalist that in this community, there were over uh, 36,000 businesses in the, in the community. The revenue was over 30 billion yuan. And uh, so it had, and this, this place, this migrant community had taken over 50% of the garment uh, retail business in Beijing. So at that time, during the 1990s to the early 2000s, even though rural migrants experienced multiple eviction campaigns, they would often leave the community briefly only to return to continue their business when the campaign ended. However, uh, a new phase started uh, in 2003, th this 2003 actually marked a new era. An uh, era began with a young man's death. You can see in this picture, uh, this man, his name is Sun Zhigang. He was a college graduate from Wuhan on March the 17th, 2003, 20 days after he arrived in Guangzhou, Sun Zhigang went outside to surf the internet, as he often did. But he was stopped by a police officer, as Sun Zhigang had not applied for a temporary res residential permit and carried no identification at that moment. He was taken into custody. The next day, he was transferred to the nearby custody and repatriation station. Sun Zhigang never made it out of the station alive. The public was enraged. It was suspected that Sun Zhigang was mistaken for a rural migrant and therefore became a victim of violence. So at that time, hundreds of scholars signed petitions. Um, so three months later, after Sun Zhigang's death, the custody and repatriation system that had existed in China for over 40 years came to an end. Um, as you can see in the picture, this was the, the time when these offices uh, were removed in China. And, <coughs> and during that peri period of time, rural migrants were, were known no longer as um, the no longer criminalized as the, the strangers in the city, but they were usually considered as the so-called vulnerable groups who deserve help and service. Uh, so the discourse has changed at the beginning of 2000, and many non-governmental organizations entered these migrant communities to set up service centers. Ironically, even though um, in discourse and in a lot of public actions, uh, rural migrants were more accepted into the urban world. However, the life for urban migrants in Chinese cities had become more and more difficult uh, for a different reason. Because around this period of time, where the, the state control over migrants were more or less um, eliminated, the fact that at that time, in metropolitan cities such as Beijing, where I did my field work, the real estate projects were rapidly proliferating. And in the same year, 2003, the total investment in real estate in Beijing 
uh, was about 19 billion. But by 2007, just four years after that, uh, the investment grew by 10 times, reaching 200 billion. So you can see this fast development of real estate became the pillar of the urban economy in China. Um, and also, in addition to that, in the city of Beijing, uh, was preparing for the Olympics in 2008. So land become very key resources. So the community uh, of rural migrants they occupy the, the land on the outskirts of Beijing, and those lands become more and more valuable. So the, their place, their community, become the target of demolition. So the living space for rural migrants were further squeezed, and migrants were constantly displaced as rural urban border shifted. And at that time, of course, compared to real estate projects, migrant business, businesses such as the garment business were no, no longer appreciated by the local government. Um, so usually migrants started to live in very uh, in, in informal buildings that were very cramped. And you can see this is the picture of the so-called um, handshake buildings, meaning the buildings are constructed very closely to each other. And this is the typical migrant children's school in Beijing, because migrants, they cannot send their children to the public school, so they have their own uh, migrant children's school on the outskirts of Beijing. So during this period of time, I would say, um, it is, the, it, it, it is usually, you see the pattern of neglect from the state, uh, because usually people would think this, the, the land that occupied by rural migrants will sooner or later be developed into uh, commercial buildings. So it's a matter of time. There is no, no need to continue to sort of uh, discipline this population anymore. So that, that was about 10 years period of time. And then the second phase, uh, the third phase came in the mid 2010s. At that time, the city government of Beijing reinforced a very a, a much stricter control over rural migrants. And at that time, this time, the control was not directly targeting rural migrants, but rather their informal business. For example, in 2014, the Beijing government started to, quote, adjustment and evacuation, to adjust and evacuate the non-capital function of the city, unquote. And in 2015, the, munif the municipal government took down Beijing's largest and most successful zoo uh, wholesale market, evict evicting over 100,000 rural migrants. And many of the, these migrants had been running small uh, businesses, operated on the urban fringe for many, many years. And then the most extreme case happened in 2017. On November 2017, a fire broke out in a migrant community, killing 19 rural migrants. And two days after the fire, the city government uh, of Beijing, deploying police and other security forces, initiated a citywide campaign to evict rural migrants um, from cheap rental apartments all over the metropolitan area, citing safety concerns. And tens of thousands of migrants were given extremely short notice and forced out of their apartments into freezing cold. Many of them had just a few days to leave uh, and even became temporarily homeless. Um, so here I'm showing some of the picture of the 2017 mass eviction campaign in Beijing. 
first. Um, you can see some of the buildings were uh, tearing down, uh, and many of the people were moving out. So the sudden eviction campaign um, really enraged, again, many uh, middle-class people, many urbanites uh, in Beijing, and quite many of them demonstrate, demonstrated their willingness to stand with rural migrants. They changed their social media profile, uh, their social uh, media profile name to low-end population a derogatory term that appeared in public media in reference to rural migrants to justify the evictions. Um, so this is the briefly you know, how things has changed over the years, and there are so many ironies and uh, um, so many kind of layered de developments regarding rural migrants uh, in China. So I have to confess that I worry every time I heard about demolition and evictions uh, that drive migrants away. But what most disturb, disturbs me, however, is not the individual moments of displacement, but the normalization of displacement. This displacement itself is usually eventful, but being displaceable is a constant state. Uh, many of the rural, rural migrants I came to know, they live in this constant state, living in this constant state of hyper uncertainty, and they have to face constant interruptions in life. So the next question is, how rural migrants cope with the population control, and how do they exist in the condition of hyper uncertainty and constant interruption? How do they exist in this uh, situation where tomorrow cannot be planned, where it is very hard to uh, plan a stable life for themselves and for their family members? Um, it turns out very few rural migrants I have encountered in China, uh, China's metropolitan cities have planned to settle, settle down in cities where they work. Many of them actually plan to purchase urban houses in other smaller uh, townships or cities after they accumulated enough money, they would put the money uh, as a down payment and to sort of a, a secure urban house and elsewhere. So for, those, for these people, for these migrants, everything is so temporal. Uh, everything becomes uh, quite, well, the future be becomes quite unpredictable. They are very much aware that they live on borrowed time and, uh, and such anticipation increase their sense of urgency when they stay in the cities because they know their stay in the urban communities is timed. So they become very much conscious of that period of time when they stay there and they know they must get into the business and try to accumulate as much as they could before it is too late. Therefore, it is not uncommon to see many of these migrants, they put long-term consideration aside and very much focus on um, their informal businesses for short-term returns. And also, at the same time, the anticipation of a sudden eviction or sudden displacement also generates, ironically, a sense of acceptance among migrants. The logic is that because they think their stay in the, city, their stay in the cities is temporary, so all the troubles and problems and suffering that are associated with this peer, period of stay 
is also temporary. So many people convince themselves to accept reality as it is. Um, so it is very common to see people use a lot of energy, energy to convince themselves. Uh, this is, there is this exercise of what I call epistemic labor of acceptance. Uh, for example, Qi Jun once told me, you need to know when to ignore the things that you cannot change. Um, and also he was convinced that he needed to, quote, differentiate what can be fixed and what cannot be fixed. So, so he could, quote, focus on the real reality. So this is not a unique case. Actually, many migrants uh, try to remind themselves every day to accept their situation as is. This actually requires constant self-preservation, storytelling, and a collective discussion among themselves. Um, so for me, temporality is critical to understand the mode of living of Chinese migrants in the metropolitan area. And for the similar reason, rural migrants also think the discrimination uh, and the, the, uh, the othering that they experience can be also temporal. And this is also something uh, that struck me because in, in everyday life, uh, it is very common for urbanites to point out um, who are the uh, uh, rural migrants because they, they do live, they do they can look a little bit different because they, they, they are the manual laborers who, who work under the sun so their skin colors can be darker and they they, they have different kind of uh, style of, of, of dressing code and and of course they also speak dialects um, so I would say we can observe uh, ob observe this uh, othering process and the essentialization of rural migrants in metropolitan China. But however, at the same time, <clears throat> the rural-urban difference in China are not understood on racial terms in the Chinese context. Rather, rural-urban differences are often explained by economic disparity and are perceived to be something to be fixed in the course of so-called development. As a result, even though rural migrants are often stuck in very difficult situation, they still sometimes they still think being in these uh, migrant community and to continue to work, for example, as informal laborers is the only way to get ahead. So when, so what I observed is that when othering process is perceived as temporal, it is very difficult for people to act upon the situation. Uh, there seems to be a perpetuated effort among the Chinese rural migrants to become someone else. They constantly feel that they are all out of place when they stay in the city, and they look forward for a future. And to achieve that future, they have to suspend their life, their present, li their present li life. Um, so this is the kind of mode of uh, living that I have observed as an anthropologist in the uh, Chinese migrant community. Uh, so at last, I would like to go back to this picture which I showed at the beginning of my talk. So I often think about my interaction with Qi Jun on, on that day. Um, because Qi Jun always 
sometimes he teases me, but sometimes he will always deny that I can fully understand uh, him and his logic and his story. Uh, many years after I have um, you know, become friends with, with him, I realize um, the fact that he deny, or he claim his um, epistemic priority in understanding his world is actually quite admirable. Uh, behind that act to sort of reject me, to re refuse my effort to understand him, I think behind that there is a desire to tell his own story. There is a desire to, uh, to acquire equality. And also there is this desire to be recognized. There is this desire to have their differences recognized and valued. So I would like to end my talk with Qi uh, Jun's um, old apartment. And I, I truly hope that uh, in the future, many of the migrants that I had got to know uh, for the past few years, they, were, uh, they, they, are, they are able to uh, develop, uh, or to achieve uh, a future that they had desired for so many years. Uh, thank you all for listening.